What's up guys, I'm Irishelle and this is Too Deep. You know, the other day I was having a conversation with a friend and the subject of other gods came up. To his surprise, we agreed on many things, especially the fact that other gods do in fact exist and still have power. For more on that, check out the first video of this series, which is called The Gods Part 1, Are Other Gods Real? Which you can find under our Too Deep category. Now, after we talked about this, the idea of worshipping these other gods came up. He explained that as long as you don't put these other gods above the creator god, then it's not wrong according to the first commandment. So let's investigate this claim. Let's read the verse he was referring to. Exodus chapter 20 verse 3. It says, You shall have no other gods before me. Now on the surface, I can see where the confusion comes from. This sounds like God is saying, don't have any other gods before him, as in above him. But let's assess this a little further. The word translated here as before is the Hebrew word pana, which means before, toward, in front of, in the presence of, to the face of, etc. So if we search that Hebrew word in the Bible, we get over 2000 results, such as Genesis chapter 17, verses 17 through 18, which says, Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. We also get verses such as Malachi chapter 3, verse 14. You have said, It is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts. Both of these verses are using the same word, pana, translated as before in both verses, and neither one of these verses are referring to something ahead of or above the Lord. If we go back to the first example, Abraham isn't pleading that Ishmael live above the Lord. Instead, he is pleading that Ishmael may live in the presence of the Lord that he would be guided by and in communion with the Lord. If we look at the second verse in Malachi, the Lord isn't saying that the people of Israel are to mourn above the Lord of hosts. He isn't talking about them putting their mourning above him, but before him, as in place it in front of him, place it at his feet. So does that mean that Pana is never translated as before, meaning above something else or coming before as in a specific place such as first? No, of course it's used in that sense. Let's look at Genesis chapter 45, verse 7. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. We also have verses such as Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. If we look at the first verse, we can clearly see that Joseph, when he, when revealing himself to his brothers, explained that God sent him before them. In other words, he was sent ahead of them or sent first. When we look at the second verse, we can see that the Lord's speaking to the people of Israel, that he is sending his messenger before him in the same way that Joseph was sent before his family to Egypt. Both of these verses are using the same Hebrew word, pana to mean ahead of. So what does that mean for the first commandment? Which of these meanings is God referring to? Well, let's keep digging. If we continue reading in the book of Exodus, we find that God continues to explain to Moses the different laws the Israelites are to uphold. In fact, only three chapters later, which is still the same conversation that we just got the Ten Commandments from, God says not to take the name of other gods. Let's read that real quick. Exodus chapter 23, verse 13. Pay attention to all that I have said to you and make no mention of the names of other gods, nor let it be heard on your lips. Now on the surface, it seems like God is saying not to even mention the names of other gods. But if we search through scripture, we find that other gods are mentioned throughout the Bible. So that can't be what God is saying. There has to be more to it. If we look at the words make mention of, we get the Hebrew word, which I'm not going to try to pronounce, which means to bring to memory. Now, the interesting thing is that whenever we see this word used is in reference to remembering some someone for something that they had done and how you now react based on their actions. It's about remembering one's legacy and how that legacy has now affected you. For instance, the fourth commandment says, 
remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, which is found in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, Psalm 77, verse 11. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. The Lord wasn't saying don't speak their names, but don't remember their names as a name that you call upon in time of help, as a name that you you believe can save you or help you. Don't hold on to their names as holy. Don't invoke their names. Why? Because we have one Savior, one God. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 through 6. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is a testimony given at the proper time. So if we go to any other God, then we are throwing away the price Jesus paid on the cross and essentially trying to use another name in the spiritual court as our defense. Okay, what am I talking about? Well, if we keep reading the different writings of Paul, he explains to us that there is a spiritual court that we enter when we pray or when we call in the name of the Lord. Colossians chapter 2 verse 13 through 15 says, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Paul says that our sin gave the kingdom of darkness legal demands over us. But when we accept the free gift of salvation through the name of Jesus Christ, we are now canceling the record of debt that stands against us. So when we call on the name of another God or remember something they have done in the past and hold to that as hope instead of to the name of the Lord, then we are trying to cancel the record of debt, those legal demands, with a name other than the name of Jesus. This is what God was warning us against from the first commandment. We can even see this in the Old Testament before Paul was even in the picture. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong power. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. Now even if we go back farther, when the Lord gave Moses the second set of stone tablets, he went before Moses proclaiming his own name. It wasn't the name of some other god. It wasn't the name of some enchantment. It was his name. It was his attributes. Let's read that real quick. Exodus chapter 34 verses 5 through 8. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. This is what the Lord was warning us of in Exodus chapter 23 verse 13 that we read earlier. We aren't supposed to focus on any other God or what they've done. We're supposed to only focus on the one true God, the God that is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. We're not to bring to memory the names and powers of gods that cannot compare to ours, gods that don't deserve worship, for only the Lord is worthy of worship. He's the only one worthy of praise. This is what the Lord was getting at. He is God alone and there is no one else that can save or help us. It's only him. It's by his stripes that we are healed. It's by his blood that we are redeemed. It's by him alone that there is breath in our lungs. Now, some will say that that's only for the people of Israel because the rest of the nations have been given the right to call upon the name of other gods. Well, let's read that verse real quick. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 19 through 20. And beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven. And when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the host of heaven, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them, things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt, to be a people of his own inheritance, as you are this day. Now on the surface, this sounds like God is saying that it's okay for all other people to worship other gods except for the Israelites. Now here's the problem with that. There is one law for the Jew and the same law 
for the Gentile according to Exodus chapter 12 verse 49. And God shows no partiality between Jews and Gentiles according to Acts chapter 10 verse 34 through 35. Now if we dig deeper into our verse we just read, Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 19 through 20, we see that the word translated as allotted is the Hebrew word that I'm not going to try to pronounce, which means to divide. So it's not so much that God has given the people of other nations the right to worship other gods, but more so that he has divided his people from this false worship. I think Jesus explains it best in John chapter 15, verse 18 through 19. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. We see the same thing in the call of Abram in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. How is this the same thing? Well, God told Abram to come out of his father's house and out of his country. Why is that significant? God explains it to us in Joshua chapter 24, verse 1 through 3. Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham and of Nahor, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac. God called Abram out of his father's house because he was calling him out of worshiping other gods. This is what God was explaining in Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 19 through 20 that we read earlier. We're called out of worshiping gods that we were never meant to worship. That's the distinction between us and the world. We don't worship gods that are beneath our God, nor do we worship false gods that are not gods but demons, which you can check out more of in our video, The Gods Part 3 demons which is under our 2d category we worship one god the almighty the alpha and the omega the prince of peace the everlasting father we worship yahweh god makes it very clear to us that there is no longer any excuse that you shouldn't worship these other gods or give them honor or call upon their name and we see this in acts chapter 17 verse 30 through 31 the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all peoples everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. The time of ignorance is no longer overlooked. In fact, this is Paul specifically explaining to a Greek council of men called the Areopagus that they can no longer worship many false gods, but instead they must only worship the one true God, the God that they don't clearly know but are trying to honor. Acts chapter 17 verse 22 through 23. So Paul standing in the midst of the Areopagus said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. If we keep reading, Paul goes on to explain who God is as well as his attributes in verses 26 through 29. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring." Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. Paul explains that even though the Areopagus 
are religious men. I believe Paul wasn't just referring to the men of the Areopagus, but all of Athens. Because they are worshipping the unknown God. They are living in sin because of all the other gods they're worshipping. Today we have the same problem. While we show honor to the one true God, we don't truly know him nor worship him the way he requires or deserves. Because we seek help from patron gods or saints when there is only one true God that can help us. There is only one God that is worthy of our praise and worship. That is the Lord God Almighty, Jesus Christ, Yahweh. So let's sum everything up for you guys. You cannot serve multiple gods no matter the hierarchy you place them in. There's only one God and one mediator between God and man. There's only one who deserves worship and that is the Lord God Almighty, Yahweh. There was a time when we were ignorant, but we are no longer ignorant for God makes himself known to each of us. But it's still up to us to seek him and the truth that he brings and offers to us. I hope this cleared up any questions that you might have had about the first commandment and other gods. And I hope that you enjoyed this video. And if you did, please feel free to like, comment, share, and subscribe to our channel. And until next time, God bless.